Suffering Minstrel returns from the wars, the trials and tribulations and the travails of the eternal traveler struggling through the world, buffeted by the winds of fate. Well, that's describing most of us. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to be a hell of a something to avoid the winds of fate and to be buffeted therefrom. And so the traveler returns once again, laden down with gifts and tales of wondrous lore. Yea, indeed, verily, but the fiendity. Segway, Joe. <laughs> yes, of course. What else do we have? You need a diagram, Joe? Of course not. Just go right into it. behind me, Joe. That's it. Very good. This was recorded exactly uh, one week ago in Killarney. I was sitting in a pub in Killarney with a tape recorder hidden in my uh, rucksack with the mic turned up, and this is just exactly the way it sounded. Uh, the only thing you don't get, of course, is the heat, the sweat, the smell of five million pints of Guinness, Smithic's Ale, Bass, uh, harp, all the other portables being drunk at great rates. Uh, this is a singing pub in the town of Killarney in southern Ireland, in fact about, uh, oh, maybe 50 feet from the coast itself, the Bay of Killarney. And when they sang about Tipperary, the reason they were all hollering is Tipperary is a town that's only a few miles from there. <laughs> You know, you keep thinking it's a long way from Tipperary, but it ain't a long way from Tipperary in Killarney. So bring it up there. You want to hear what a, what a pub in Ireland sounds like? A singing pub. A special kind of pub. And this is the biggest, fastest growing thing in Ireland. They never stop. They sing continuously in a singing pub. There is about, I would say, close to 300 people in there. There's no way... Another person can get packed in there. They're absolutely packed solid. And they start this hoopla about 7 o'clock at night, and they go till closing time. They just do not stop, one song after the other. And there's one guy who leads everybody in singing. He's like the MC, but he doesn't, he doesn't, no MC. He just stands up there and, and sings one song after the other, and they just fall in with him and sing. And if you feel like taking over the mic for a while, and uh, singing a special uh, request or anything, that's fine. As long as everybody can sing it with you. This is a singing club. Listen to the voices behind yelling out. Oh. Now, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, it sounds, it sounds insane, but they really do sing McNamara's band in Ireland. I was surprised, you know, and they also they, they all start crying when they sing the Rose of Tralee, which is another town just very shortly down the road from the city of Killarney. Killarney is one of the most beautiful spots in the world. It really is. Uh, I've traveled all over the world, and Killarney has to be physically one of the most beautiful places in the entire world. Well, in the entire globe, uh, the, the lakes of Killarney lie there, and the great mountains of Killarney rise all around the town. The river flows through it down to the sea, and it's just a lovely, lovely spot. It's always green. Killarney never has what we have in our country, a winter. It never gets cold, not like we know cold. Rarely, if ever, snows. And Killarney is one of the most Irish of all, if you can call a town more Irish than another, Killarney is one of the most Irish of all, of all Irish 
towns. It's only a 6,000 population town, which by Irish standards is a pretty good sized city, really. Uh, narrow streets, hundreds of great, fantastic pubs, and it's a town that just is absolutely vibrating with life. <laughs> just vibrant. And uh, this is the national anthem they're singing now. They always end the night with singing the national anthem, and they all stand as they sing it. This is the Irish Republic National Anthem. Keep it up, Joe. We're not going to get it out of there. Now you're listening to the boyos sitting around yelling and hollering. Now, this is a special night, I must point out to you, in a way. Uh, just just a little, there you go. I'll holler at you like to ho you have to holler in the pub. Uh, the waiters are swirling in and out of the crowd with, with trays covered with pints or jars, as they call them. I'll have a jar of Guinness, please. And... Uh, Guinness is a very uh, mild, rich, uh, dark, almost black drink. You, if you've ever seen Guinness Stout, well, the bottled stout that we know here in this country, the Guinness that you get in the bottles, tastes nothing at all like the stout that you get, the Guinness uh, that is drunk in Ireland, the draft Guinness. It's just a completely different drink, and it's almost a national religion. And uh, all the boyos are sitting around now drinking up the stout and the smithic sale. And this is the eve, actually it's the night after one of the great sporting events in Ireland. Uh, Dublin defeated in a stunning upset. D uh, Dublin, which is the city up north, of course, on the, on the coast, Dublin defeated Cork in a fantastic upset to gain the National Irish Football Final. And it was like the World Series, see, and they, they beat Cork in a stunning upset by six points, which is a tremendous defeat. And now the pub is filled with Cork advocates. Uh, Cork is very near uh, Killarney, and there's a few sore heads down from Dublin. And the tables are, are packed with Cork crowds, and they take their sports very seriously. These are, these are tough Irishmen sitting around with their pints and their jars. And uh, every once in a while, somebody will hold, oh, 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 say up dub. Uh, it, this means up Dublin, which in their phraseology is hooray for Dublin. In our terms, that would mean something else. Or you'll hear some guy suddenly leap out of the crowd and say, up the corks. And of course, then immediately there's a large boo from the Dublin crowd. And uh, the, the pub keeper was walking around keeping a sharp eye on that gang back where I was sitting because any minute now, a real, uh, well, in, in this case, it would be a true one. A, a true uh, rhubarb could break out. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, the boys were sitting at different tables. And, uh, of course, they were with their girls. And it, the, this re was recorded just before closing time. Closing time comes in by national order and law in Ireland at 11.30. Now, they're all sitting around. they got a couple of minutes, and they're, they're ordering cra like crazy so they can have two or three jars to drink after the pub closes. In a couple of minutes, you'll hear the, the publican, uh, Larry himself, walk around the crowd telling them all it's time to go home. And he does it with great vehemence. So listen carefully for it. This is a this is a tradition in Irish pubs. He, they use two phrases. One of them, uh, "Go to your places," which means "Go on home," <laughs> just go on to where you belong. Or else he'll say, "Time, gentlemen, please, time," meaning it's time to close. And uh, the the tables uh, in the pub are just covered with empties, dead Indians, and uh, now and. and Sporadic singing breaks out. Now here's a crowd from Cork singing. They'll just sporadically start singing. Just turn that up and you'll hear the sound of an Irish pub going full blast. And 
once in a while a crowd will start singing the, uh, let's say, the Cork fight song. Uh, Cork has its own fight song. It's a, it's a ball team, you know. And uh, some of the guys were wearing their Cork emblems. Other guys were wearing their Dublin emblems. And uh, it was a fantastic evening there in Vaughan. This is, this is actually called the Laurels. The, the actual name of the pub is the Laurels. Although the singing pub has uh, broken out all over Ireland. Now, in case you're wondering what all this is about, I just got back from Ireland last night after two fantastic weeks. Did you hear that? Now, now, if you'll go back to that, Joe, and turn it up. Just, just stop the tape right here. Hold it there. Now go back, and you'll hear the Irish publican uh, beseeching the singers and the dancers, and they were doing that, and the drinkers and the boyos in general, that it's time to get, you know, get the hell out. We've had enough of this. It's just right back there, Joe. That's it. Just bring it on, and when you hear this, turn it up. This is one of the most authentic sounds of Irish life, a publican kicking them out. And nobody leaves an Irish pub before closing time. It's a matter of faith. Listen carefully now. Well, you'll hear them, Joe. Just sit there. Ladies and gentlemen, in your right place. That was the public, and uh, and he was really bugged. He was he was going around there picking up the bottles, and you heard the cheer when he showed up. Uh, and they're not moving. They they're not going to move uh, until it looks like he's getting serious. And a large group of his his very muscular bartenders start moving among the crowd. Uh, this is a <laughs> this is a wild uh, midweek night in uh, in an Irish pub. And by the way, you're listening to W O R New York. And before we go any further, Joe, uh, what more fitting than to give him a beer commercial here, Joe? Just hit the beer spot. Hey. Isn't this a great night for a long, tall, cool one? What brand of beer do you drink? Do you know there's a really great-tasting beer around these days? Do you know it's Valentine beer? Do you realize you're really missing out on something if you're not drinking Valentine? Who do we think we are asking these tough questions? We're the people with the answer, the only answer, Valentine. Yeah, Valentine, uh... You don't see much Valentine in Ireland, although you do actually in some places. Yeah, you, you know, you go to these very elegant pubs in some places, and you'll see a lot of uh, over there. That's imported uh, exotic products. Uh, you actually will see Valentine in a few of these pubs. I don't know how they get it over there, but there it is. But what you generally see in the pubs, of course, uh, you find Guinness, Guinness Stout being drunk, uh, Smithics. Actually spelled Smithwicks, but it's pronounced Smithics, uh, which is a very, uh, I think, an evil drink. It's a it's a bad tasting drink. <laughs> Double D, which is another ale. Uh, most of their drinks are are much darker than ours. They don't have many light ones. The lightest of all of them, I guess, over there would be Harp, uh, which is a lager. Uh, they don't actually call for it by name over there. They're, a guy will walk into a pub and he'll just say, oh, give me a, a pint of locker, please, meaning he wants a uh, harp, uh, and, and uh, he'll drink this down. Uh, you don't find as much whiskey drinking as, uh, as I suppose you might say, legend has it. Uh, it is not drunk that much. Just once in a great while, a guy will have some to, to accompany uh, like a chaser or something for his, uh, his Guinness for the night, and in that case, he'll be drinking patties. Uh, possibly uh, Jameson. Uh, they have a, a thing over there called Jameson Green Spot 10, which is a 10-year-old Jameson, a very elegant Irish whiskey. <laughs> uh, you'll see ladies occasionally sitting off to one side. Of course, ladies go to the pub over there, old ladies, all kinds of things. It's not like our taverns here. Uh, there is a family affair, their pubs. And you'll see kids, you'll see uh, old men, old ladies. There's very little generation gap in Ireland, by the way, which is interesting to note. Uh, people speak on absolute equal terms, and so you'll never hear uh, a young Irishman say to an older one, well, you don't understand because you're not of my generation. 
Well, I had, I had to get a big laugh in the pub. Uh, <laughs> and he'd find himself walking home that night. But uh, it's not, uh, they don't have a lot of the myths going that we have. And it's kind of refreshing to be in a world where everybody's a human being and judged on that and that alone. And uh, you'll see old ladies in the pubs. And you see them occasionally, an old lady who is having a, uh, let's say, a festive evening will be sitting with a little tiny thimble full of Irish mist, which is a liqueur. You've probably had it, Joe. It's a, it's a liqueur, and the ladies will sit and have their little Irish mist, and uh, they'll talk and go on. And I, uh, I, I was fascinated by the Irish pub life. If you know anything about Irish pub life, you don't really know much about Ireland because it is uh, next to the church and uh, politics. No, that's right. Those are the three, the triad of Irish life. And it's very common to see a, a magnificent uh, 12th century church right in the middle of a town, a little town, just beautiful. They're, they're, they're unbelievable buildings. A 12th century church, this cathedral will be standing there. And right across the street, a very he- easy reach, uh, there'll be seven pubs all lined up, cheek by jowl, Moran's, uh, Morrissey's, Malachy's, they'll all be in one line, say, and next to it will be uh, Alfie Mooney's turf accountant office. Uh, this is a betting emporia. Uh, it's where you go, you lay a bet. Now, it, it makes it very handy. I heard an Irishman say it makes it very handy. A man can go in and he, he, loses, uh, he loses a pound or two on the ponies and realizes that he's sinned. He can rush right into the church and, and confess, uh, which is always traumatic to an Irishman, and rush right out to Mooney's and have a pint to recover from his confession. And then he can go back to Alfie's again and lose another two bobs, and he just keeps that up all day long. <laughs> At least on his day off. Uh, before we go any further, we have a couple of other spots here. And, and I have, I'm going to do three or four shows in a row of, in Kelly's life. Uh, I've got some fantastic recordings, really great recordings. I was over in Ireland, of course, during all the, the, uh, the resignation of ex-President Nixon, and uh, that was fascinating. Uh, The Irish just were absolutely intrigued by the whole thing, and and, uh, this was all you heard for for days out there. Everywhere you'd go, you'd go into a pub, and immediately they spot you as an American. They want to talk to you about it, and I'll do a whole show on that, uh, I guess, tomorrow night, if you're you're curious about it, and and I'm sure you will be, because uh, they, they, uh, they have great rapport with America, you know, the Irishmen, and the Irish people I met over there have particular rapport with Irish politicians because so many of our politicians have been Irish, ranging all the way, you know, Irish antecedents, ranging all the way from Jack Kennedy uh, on up uh, through uh, thousands of mayors of America, and uh, the Irish politician is legendary, so they have a great involvement with it. They're much more political people than we are and very knowledgeable about it. I heard one Irishman say, I will not tip it any further than this. I heard one Irishman say, though, after he heard the first two or three reports after Mr. Nixon retired, uh, he heard two or three reports on the telly, or RTE as they call it over there, that, uh, you know, that they were, uh, there were, there was a group of people who were thinking of uh, pursuing Mr. Nixon and, uh, and uh, indicting him and winding up possibly in jail. He was amazed at this. He said, he says, you know, the Americans really do believe in revenge, you know. And uh, <laughs> and interesting, you hear it. He says, they really do believe in revenge. And uh, he says, I, it would seem to me that the poor man has, has paid for his crimes many times over. What more, uh, what more terrible revenge could you have or, or punishment could you have than making a man resign from the most uh, public and the most powerful office in the world? And the world, uh, <laughs> and it's a point there, you know. And uh, just hearing, uh, so I'm taking no political stand one way or the other. But I, a lot of very interesting things I heard over there about politics, the Americans who back the IRA. Well, a lot of Irishmen are very furious about that, and uh, it's a it's an old whole big thing going on. Uh, but uh, before we go any further with Ireland, which is incidentally, I'll, I'll say before I go any further. Um, has to be, to, and I have traveled around the world several times, as you know, Joe, all the way from the Far East. I've uh, been around the world uh, three or four times on a very, very extensive basis. I spent much time in India 
and the in the Orient and uh, throughout the Middle East, I would have to say Ireland is most is the most consistently physically beautiful country anywhere in the world. It is just a stunningly beautiful country. You just can't comprehend the beauty of Ireland. If you go to Ireland and spend your two weeks in Dublin, uh, that would be like coming to America and spending your two weeks on Times Square and then thinking you've seen America. <laughs> it would be a tragic. But the, the, the coast of Ireland, down in County Kerry, uh, Connemara, is just the most stunningly moon-like, beautiful landscape, I think, in the world. It's just an incredible place where, 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 you can, where the visibility, for example, you can see probably for 40 miles. In fact, I heard one report on the air. They give a daily weather report as to visibility all around the country. One report said a 43-mile visibility in Connemara. Can you imagine 43 miles visibility? <laughs> that would be like uh, standing in, in New York and uh, clearly seeing Trenton uh, off on the distance. <laughs> that's the truth. And it's that, that kind of country and the, the great vast blue sky that arches over it. But uh, I, I have a lot to say about Ireland. But before we go any further, how about a few dinghies here? Our air shipping service is better. Our service is better. Ours goes anywhere. To bring sanity to the clutter of air shipping claims, here's a message from Tom Cole, president of REA Air Express, to clear the air once and for all. Look, every air shipping service claims it's faster, bigger, or whatever. I say put up or shut up. Last year, REA Air Express handled a million shipments more than Emory, Airborne, and Shulman combined. Only Air Express offers priority boarding of your shipments on the first flight out. And only Air Express gives door-to-door -door service to 450 airport cities and 22,000 communities under the control of one carrier, one management. Insist on the original Air Express, REA Air Express. It's the service with the differences that you, the shipper, demand. So prove it yourself, like six and a half million shippers did last year. Just look us up in the white or yellow pages and call for a fast pickup. But whatever you do, don't be fooled by imitators. Things are confused enough. A generation ago, Frank Sinatra introduced a love song to his daughter Nancy. Now a new Frank Sinatra, the doting grandfather. Nancy with the laughing face has presented old blue eyes with his first granddaughter. And in the current issue of Ladies Home Journal, Frank Sinatra writes her a tribute, plus exclusive first photos of Frank and his granddaughter. Also in the journal, a report on hormone therapy. Can it give you extra years of vitality? The cost-cutting secrets of American families learning to deal with inflation. And an insider's look at Joan Kennedy's pressure-filled life. This month's journal book bonus is an exclusive preview of James A. Michener's major new novel, Centennial. Also a special section on how to change your looks and outlook. And a noted psychiatrist cautions parents, don't close the generation gap. All in the new Ladies' Home Journal, The Priceless Environment, on newsstand now. Someday you'll own, someday you'll own, sooner or later you'll own generals. Yeah, sooner or later, friends, uh, you're going to need generals. Uh, come on, bring it up there, Joe. That's it. Bring that music up behind the chief here. And uh, they're such beautiful tires. They're round and fat. And by the way, they're having a pre-Labor Day tire sale. And they're really having a fantastic sale. So get on down, down to your general tire dealer and get yourself a new set of rubber for the forthcoming winter. Oh, <laughs> winter. Oh, wow. See your general tire headquarters at State Line Tire, West Putnam Avenue in Greenwich. See big old Lou Galasso. Yeah, yeah. Sooner or later, you alone, the generals. Get them full. Yeah, yeah. That's it, Joe. That's it. Just sneak it in there. Keep that crowd behind me. It makes me feel good. Hear all them boyos drinking the Guinness there. <laughs> I just want you to hear the sound of the violin. Now, this was uh, not uh, not recorded uh, ostentatiously. I just sat in the back there. It was the only place I could get a seat, actually. Fantastic crowd. 
and uh, just turn the gain up and just let it run. I didn't even mess around with it at all. Uh, of course, it's a professional tape recorder. This is not the kind that you get the wind-up type that you get by mail from your credit card company. Uh, and <laughs> it's a goodie. But uh, these are the voices of Irishmen celebrating just being alive, I guess, uh, just after the closing call has been called out. Now, not a soul has moved. I have to point out to you that he, he's gone around and says, go to your places, and uh, they have not decided to do it yet. It takes a while for an Irishman to unwind. Let's just uh, bring it up there. Now, I'd li I have to explain that there's all kinds of pubs in Ireland, uh, and the pub is the center of much of Irish social life, political life, too. And uh, the pubs range all the way from little tiny clubs where uh, the man has a little combined tiny grocery store. And I've been in these little tiny locals where the same people have been coming for 40 years. Uh, and they come in every night and they have their couple of jars of Guinness. And there may be only two or three people, maybe five people in this little tiny pub. Uh, all the way on up to the to the big singing pubs, which are very much Irish, by the way. This is not a tourist gimmick. This is Irish. They love this uh, singing pub. And I'm going to have to announce something to you, which uh, probably you, or many of you will not like. Rock is dead. No, it really is. The last time I was in Ireland, which was about two years ago, all over the British Isles, of course, rock was uh, heard on the radio. But now rock is gone, really gone. And... Uh, C&W has taken its place all over the continent, uh, in, in uh, Great Britain, all over the British Isles. Merle Haggard today is a far bigger figure, much bigger name than, say, David Bowie. <laughs> I mean, by far. And uh, you hear them uh, hour after hour uh, playing Dolly Parton records, Merle Haggard, and uh, they're all excited because they think that uh, within the next month or two, a couple of the big uh, C&W stars from America are coming to Dublin. And that was all they were talking about on the radio. They said that Dottie West is coming over there. You know who Dottie West is? She's the girl that sings on the Coca-Cola commercials. <laughs> you might hear her. But she's a big C&W star. And uh, it's a fact that uh, rock is done. And... Uh, it's, it's holding on just uh, in the only one place in the world where rock is still holding on are in the few of the reactionary radio stations in America. Uh, curiously enough, it is considered progressive in Europe to play C&W, which is a very whole new sound. So if you're a C&W fan, uh, very shortly you're going to be inundated. Everybody you know is going to be talking about C&W, even the klutzes that are walking around today still clinging to their uh, Rolling Stones records, uh, which is out of the past, really, <laughs> in the world. But in Ireland, uh, it's uh, you hear Irishmen. It's funny, I heard a, a German get up. It was fascinating to hear a German get up in this pub. And I got a guy about 22, maybe, big uh, strapping German uh, type, and he was good, incidentally. He got up, he just came up out of the crowd, and what did he sing? He sang the Wabash Cannonball, and he sang, he followed up with Mule Skinner's Blues. Now, he didn't quite sing it like Dolly Parton. He sang it with a strong Prussian accent. Listen to the boils. They're starting again. Listen to this. This is the crowd from Cork. They were really bugged because they had lost that ball game. They figured that by singing loudly, they could undo it. It didn't help. It's a, it, uh, singing does not win tenants any more in, in Dublin or Cork than it does in Flushing. You can sing the Mets song all you want, but Tom Seaver's still having trouble with his shoulder. <laughs> no. <laughs> now I have to give you a little more, uh, a little more background on, on Killarney. Uh, before we do, uh, I have something I have to say before we do, because we've been getting all kinds of letters about it, Joe. Our show this year, every year, I have a big annual show. My, the only live performance I do for the general public in New York, in the New York area, is done at Carnegie Hall every fall. This is my third Carnegie Hall show, and uh, this year it's the 14th, which is a Saturday night, so 
get the babysitter all set, send your wife away on a vacation, take the babysitter, and come to Carnegie Hall Saturday night. You'll have a hell of a night. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> I know many guys that have done that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the box office, don't write us about it. We, uh, there are no seats or so, anything sold here. The box office at Carnegie Hall opens Wednesday, the 28th. So get down there. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Ireland is a highly complex country, regardless of what uh, Jimmy Breslin says about it. An extremely complex country, uh, religiously, politically, many other ways. It's beautiful. It's tragic. Uh, it's it's highly poetic. You 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 spend 20 minutes uh, walking around Dublin, and you feel like sitting down and writing a novel. It's just that kind of place. There's there you bring them up there, Joe. Don't don't sneak them out on me. Keep the boys there until closing time. Uh, Killarney, as a city. That's a little... Hear, hear what they're singing? Dublin, hear that? That's the Dublin crowd trying to outshout the Cork crowd that are singing, singing live, alive, all. la da dee 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 You know, it's, 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 it's a fascinating thing about it. It's a remarkably good-natured crowd. Uh, you don't find many Irish truculent drinkers. Uh, they don't drink for the same reason many people in our country drink. Many people in our country drink to forget or to escape or any one of a dozen things, which, of course, drink never does. It only brings out the truth. <laughs> in wine, there is truth. And and uh, the Dubliner and the Irish... Uh, he's telling them to go again, see? There's a general muttering of discontent. Uh, they'll slowly begin to get up and go now. They realize the inevitability that they're going to have to go. Uh, if they don't, there's going to be a large group of the Gardai, or Garda, which is the local police come in and round them up, and the next thing you know, Malachi and Patty may wind up in the slammer for the night. So, uh, <laughs> and they're jovial, you know. They're not mad. They're just sitting there enjoying themselves. They're not, they're not truculent. You don't, you don't find bar fights. This is almost unknown in Ireland. The guys just go there. It's part of their life. And uh, it's part of the Irish marriage, as a matter of fact. Unfortunately, it, uh, it, it, does not, uh, it does not add much to the Irish marriage when Patty spends every night from 6 until closing time putting away his nightly jars. And uh, his wife is back there with the brood. It, uh, it's not a good life. A woman's Lib has a fantastic uh, field wide open in Ireland. Let me tell you that. Now, that's not to say that ladies don't come to the pub, but it's generally the older ones who have raised the kids, and uh, now they can just go and sit. Or they're very young. The, the middle are at home, back in the cottage. And uh, Patty, he doesn't stop. He's, he's right back there with his, his lads, his, his mates. He's never left them. Uh, he was with his mates when he was 10, and he's with them yet. And he'll be with them when he dies. They'll carry his coffin down to St. Patrick's Cemetery. And uh, they're, they're together through their whole lives. Mateship, by the way, which means male friendship, is very much part of Irish life. A man has his mates. And uh, it centers around the pub. Now, Killarney is a magnificent town. Uh, if you can just cut it down, Joe, stop it for a minute. We'll come back to it, and I'll tell you a little bit about Killarney if you're going to visit Ireland. Uh, I have a map here before me, and uh, I'm looking at it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the official map of Ireland, which was uh, published by the Irish state, and it's very authentic. Now, Dublin, of course, is up on the east coast on the Irish Sea right on the coast, and it's a big, uh, famous uh, seacoast town, and it's, uh, it's a, uh, an industrial, lovely city, by the way. Dublin is a, just a beautiful city. Uh, and uh, as you come south, you go down through Kildare, if you're going to head towards the uh, far southern, uh, the southwestern part of uh, Ireland. And, and incidentally, the county plays a very strong role in Irish life. Uh, and so a man will describe where he's from, not by the town so much, but by the county. 
So uh, somebody will say, uh, uh, they'll be talking about uh, Michael or Patrick, and someone will say, well, he's a County Clare man, uh, which tells you just about where he is or where he's from. Uh, he, will, he may be, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the counties, of course, differ one from the other. Uh, some of them are more agriculture than others. Uh, some are more industrial than others. But in general, the, the, the country uh, is a lot more complex sociologically than you would be given to believe by reading top writers about Ireland. Now, I've traveled all over Ireland pretty much. I have been in Belfast uh, in my past travels. I didn't go to Belfast over this past uh, trip but I spent most of my time uh, traveling from uh, Dublin all the way down through uh, such t uh, cities as Kildare, Kilkenny, uh, Cashel, which, by the way, is uh, probably the most uh, historically interesting city of all of Ireland. It's the, it's the legendary first place where Irish life began to develop. Uh, it was the earliest capital of Ireland, and uh, it, there is a, there's a fantastic abbey that overlooks the entire city of uh, Cashel, which is just stunning. Uh, it was built in the uh, ninth and the tenth centuries, and it still stands looking down on the, looking down on the town, and uh, you can, it's just beautiful. Uh, they, the things that, that I, I don't want to talk too much, uh, unfortunately there's so much to say about Ireland. Uh, probably one of the great uh, sub-themes of Irish life is the Irish horse. Uh, and and I, I, I'm going to do an entire show about the horse because I covered, among other things, the first week I was in Ireland, I covered the Royal Dublin Show, or the IDS, RDS, which is one of the most prestigious, elegant horse shows in the world. And, you know, you get a, a real sense of pride when you see the American equestrian team, which is consist, consists today largely of very young men, uh, the youngest team probably in the history of international show jumping. Uh, we have jumpers that are 18, 17, 18 years old, uh, people like uh, Dennis Murphy, who's 18 roughly, isn't he 18, 19, something, is he? Well, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting instructions now from the front. But uh, Dennis Murphy is a young man. He's 24, 25, which by international jumping standards is very young. Uh, we have uh, Buddy Brown, who is 18. I know that. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, but the, the, by international standards, these are, these are guys who, who would not even, uh, in most international teams, would be given the chance to really groom the horses. Uh, this is unheard of. When you stop to think of some of the great international riders, such as uh, Peter... Uh, Oh, the uh, the Englishman uh, David Broom, for example, is in his probably uh, late thirties, early forties. He's a great international writer. Uh, our our uh, ex captain Billy Steinkraus was in his forties when he won his gold medal at the Olympics. So this is a sport where it's not a sport for the for the young man really because it takes many years to to le to learn the horse lore and the international jumping uh, techniques and cool and all the rest of it to be able to win on the international scene. And to see a guy like Buddy, Buddy Brown, who is 18 years old, win the Irish Grand Prix, which is one of the toughest of all the international jumping events. And the, the Irish people went out of their birds. Uh, he is the biggest hero today in Ireland. Uh, and he said, ironically, he says, I probably don't even know about me back in America. He is the biggest hero in Ireland today. Everywhere I went, they were talking about Buddy Brown. Now, you haven't heard that name, have you? Buddy Brown is the young man, 18 years old, who won the Irish Grand Prix, which closed the Irish Horse Show uh, on, on a Sunday afternoon a week or so ago uh, in, a, in a cloudy day, unbelievably dramatic, the stands packed with people, and he was jumping off against the world champion. Uh, who was the uh, the German champion, which is, uh, by the way, a state-controlled and operated team. Uh, these are these are guys that, like the Russians, they're they're <laughs> they're paid literally by the state. Uh, ours are all amateur; they get nothing at all from the government. And uh, Buddy Brown defeated uh, Peter. What's his last name? Peter Robson. P 
Peter Robeson, who is the head of the British team, uh, the mo- one of the most, in his 50s, by the way, Peter Robeson is a great international jumper and uh, heads the British team. And, of course, the British team has been a power in the international jumping for, for ever since there's been international jumping. The British, of course, have made a, a tradition of, uh, of show jumping and uh, hunting and so on. And to beat Peter Robeson would be really roughly like to take a high school kid who's a pitcher for a high school ball team and he comes in in the last game of the World Series and strikes out Hank Aaron, he strikes out Dick Allen, he then uh, polishes it off by uh, by picking uh, Lou Brock off first base <laughs> and, and then uh, doubles home the winning run uh, at the age of 16. Uh, well, uh, this is what Buddy Brown did, and the people, they, they saw it on television in color. There was such a fantastic victory that all over Ireland they were talking about Buddy Brown, the incredible uh, victory in the Irish Grand Prix. And uh, he did it the hard way, uh, beating the best in the world. Anyway, it was a great feeling to sit in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the international crowd there and watch an American do something like that. And this was uh, just after Nixon had... Uh, had uh, resigned, and you know there was we were at a low ebb, and all of a sudden this fantastic victory, and the crowd just went ape. Now, would you please bring up a little more of that uh, that crowd cheering there, just a, a little more? There, bring them in. Oh, do we have a Miller spot? Okay, let's hear the Miller beer spot. His daddy played cornet, and his mama played honky tonk piano. He was born on a bus traveling to a one night stand in Joplin. He picked up a guitar when he was seven, and he's never put it down. And for the last 30 years, he's plied his trade, playing blues and rock and country, making some of the sweetest music you'll ever hear. He works where most people relax, in a thousand nameless saloons that dot the land. So when he relaxes, he gets real loose, heads for some old sidemen and the best-tasting beer he can find. If you've got the time, we've got the beer, never beer. That's what Miller Time is all about. Taking time to appreciate the difference between a good beer and a great beer. Miller High Life, America's quality beer since 1855. There we go. Bring it in, Joe. There we go. Okay, bring the crowd in. Where's the crowd? It's off, huh? Okay. All right. That's the way it goes. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, don't worry about it now. It's too late. Don't worry about it. That's an order. Uh, we'll we'll have more Irish tapes for you. Some fantastic tapes that I did in uh, in Ireland uh, at the horse show. Uh, some great tapes that I did in an Irish castle. You know, just the sounds of Ireland. And I think you you, you get a lot of the feeling of a country out of the sounds. You know. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's hard to describe uh, uh, an entire country. You can't, no way. Uh, but uh, we'll try to do it very subjectively. I heard one Irishman say, you know, when we were, I was in this pub, in, uh, and I believe it was in Dublin, yeah. He comes over to me, and he sat right down next to me, and he says, I was sketching some old ladies. And he says, hey, he said, uh, you're sketching the old ladies there, huh? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, he says, they're a great crowd. He says, wait until you see them get kicked out by the publican. <laughs> and I waited, and sure enough, these old dolls, the publican came right over and looked at their table, and there were six old ladies, not one of whom was under 80, sitting there with their empty glasses of uh, Guinness in front of them. And he says, ladies, why don't you go home to bed where you belong? And uh, they laughed, and they got up uh, and uh, left quietly into the night. They would be back the next night, of course. So uh, hang loose, think clean thoughts, and uh, remember there are pe- there are people in the world who laugh. That's the thing that you'll find most in Ireland. These people laugh constantly. Of course, uh, they have a lot to laugh about. What with their tangled political mess and a lot of other things, they tend to laugh about their politics. We get mad and call up Dan Rather. There's a lot going out there. Uh,